I'm just going to say a few words to introduce folks to Mickey. Um, we're yeah overjoyed, Mickey, to have you with us today. Um, what to say? I was sharing with Kazu this morning a little bit of nervousness about introducing you um, because I just I feel like it's it's so hard to even contain the contributions that you're making to the movement. Um, I from my own experience, I, I can't say how many times I'm in a movement setting, working on one project or another with people who are um, trying to make things better in any number of ways. And a concept or teaching uh, that has come from you, Mickey, is brought up. And often people, it's come to the point where often people don't know who they're referencing. But some of us who have heard that directly from you know, oh, that's Mickey. Oh, there's Mickey mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. the, the teaching has become, is becoming ubiquitous in movement spaces. And mm -hmm. to me, that's such a beautiful thing to see the, see the way that your work has become part of the fabric of our movement ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And that work encompasses incredible things. I was just looking at the list of, of monthly calls that you're hosting about facing privilege, overcoming patriarchy, questioning money, reckoning with collapse, hosting those calls on a monthly basis, doing consultation work with movements and uh, movements in the making from Extinction Rebellion to the yet to be named network that Kazu and I are working on, just dropping in such incredibly helpful wisdom and concrete organizational structures that are enabling us to do better work than we otherwise would. For folks who are interested in learning more about Mickey, check out Nonviolent Global Liberation, an incredible project. You can look at her blog at fearlessheart.org and her website, mickeykashtan.org to learn more. We're grateful for you. So glad that you're on the planet with us at this time, Mickey, and thanks for spending this time with us today. Um, I wanna tell you, Chris, that this is, um, this has been a very moving way to be introduced. I don't usually like it when people introduce me, um, but this was from the heart. I really felt it uh, and it came from the heart to the heart. So thank you so much. Yeah. Cool. So I want to uh, say, I, I, you know, as Chris was saying, I put my hands in just about everything. I, I work from the smallest, in most internal domain to global governance. And it's always kind of like a big choice what to focus on. So I decided to focus on decision-making because if we get decision-making right, then we can go from there to making all the decisions that we need to make to create a collaborative nonviolent future. That's why I focused in this way, and um, and we'll see if that yields benefit. Uh, now, will you advance to the next one? Yeah. So um, this is the way I see things, and um, I look at the coronavirus situation as something that is um, exposing. It's an opportunity in that it exposes things that have been there all along for quite a while, but we're under the surface and suddenly there's crisis. And now the opportunity is that we can see it's like there are cracks. So it's even more visible, this thing that I've been saying for a while that we either have a nonviolent future or we have no future because the, the kind of present that we have, that is the, the way of living that is based on scarcity, separation, and powerlessness, that comes from 7,000 years of patriarchy. It's the core essence of patriarchy is scarcity, separation, and powerlessness. Patriarchy manifests in gender, but isn't about gender. Gender emerges from it. The, the two main things I see in patriarchy are control and either or thinking. And that is what I'm gonna try to show how, in how we approach decision-making, we can exit those and go to a nonviolent future of choice, togetherness and flow. 
so that control is replaced by purpose and either or thinking is replaced by integration. Okay, so this is not a picture of me, but it is. it could have been a picture of me. I was in the Israeli army. This is where I'm from. Um, I didn't want to be in the Israeli army. I wasn't a pacifist. I just couldn't stand the idea of war for as long as I remember. It took me 10 years to recover from being in the army. I was saved by feminism. Feminism for me, um, what it did for me is showing me that what we have is not all there is that is possible. That an another world is possible, like, like what the World Social Forum was saying, that slogan. That came to me in 1985 through feminism. And long journey from there, where I, where I came to in the end is these three pieces. Human nature, and, and the, okay, I, wanna, I will say this, that every, a lot of people are saying, who cares about theory? Let's just do things that we need to do. Theory, if it's not made explicit, if we don't know what our theory is, then we will implicitly inherit the theory that comes from the dominant culture. And the theory that comes from the dominant culture sees human beings as selfish, greedy, and needing to be controlled. This is how we raise our children. This is what happens generation after generation. This is what reproduces violence and all of those things. So to have a different picture of human nature and to have faith and love that guide that to me is absolutely core to nonviolence, goes straight back to Gandhi. I, I don't, I'm not gonna remember the quote, but um, you know, the person who engages in nonviolence, even if somebody cheats them 20 times, they will give them their trust the 21st time because um, critical to the creed of nonviolence, as Gandhi said it, is faith in human nature. Understanding people as functioning based on needs and from there wanting to create a world based on needs, based on attending to needs, to me is key to a nonviolent future. Second thing is um, we are so used to coercion that we don't even see it when it's there. So for example, incentives, which is what everybody uses to make things happen is through incentives. Incentives are a form of coercion. So instead of incentives, I am adopting willingness as a core organizing principle. And it's magical what happens when people really honor willingness as a core principle. Then you, you stop having th things like people propping up systems that don't work. And, and the voids are exposed because if something, if no one is willing to do something, then it won't happen. And if it doesn't happen, then you know that you have a hole and you see the systemic gaps. And the last thing to complete my personal path is that I believe in creating systemic agreements that are within capacity that's that's a relatively new framing that I have just a few months based on personal experiences of being in the desert. Um, you, people can find find it on my blog. But fundamentally, I see now that most of us, most of the time, make agreements based on aspiration or based on obligation. What is the right thing? And if instead we learn to do agreements that are completely attuned to where we actually have capacity, the agreements become support rather than rules that coerce. When agreements support us, we increase collective capacity by not having to work so hard as individuals to function in the way that we want to. Okay, That's so talking about faith, my fundamental faith is that we evolved through and for collaboration. It isn't foreign to us. There's more and more even evidence that we are collaborative by nature. We have been trained to believe otherwise. 
but that is the faith that is guiding. So if our faith is that we are collaborative, then we have to explain um, coercive, competitive, etc. behavior. If our faith is, um, if our belief is that human beings are out to, to do only for themselves and care nothing about others, then we have to explain collaborative behavior. They're not able to explain collaborative behavior from within their framework. It's, they're going kind of like this, but it's actually very easy and painful and wrenching to explain how a collaborative species has arrived at uh, behaviors that we have right now. This is not part of what I'm going to be talking about today, but if you are interested and you poke around uh, the Fearless Heart website, you will find articles that talk about the history of how we came to be where we are, what parenting has got to do with it, and all kinds of things. So I'm just going to focus on, on the results of it, not how we got here. So one of the ways that we have either or thinking is we've been trained to believe that efficiency and collaboration don't go together. So if we want efficiency, which most people who are trying to make something happen want, they will say, okay, so we have to give up on collaboration. We're just going to do command and control because it's efficient. Yes, it is efficient in the short term and the long-term costs are not calculated into it. Then there's this thing that my sister called crisis of imagination. Our collaboration muscles have atrophied because they haven't been exercised for so long that we don't know what to do or how to do it or how to see beyond the, oh my God, I want this and you want that. Okay, there's nothing to be done except arm wrestle and one of us will win. There's no systemic support for collaboration. We are habituated to competing. And the only way out of competing that we know is command and control. This is why when you look at organizations, they function command and control vertically, competition horizontally. And, and the command and control is what suppresses the, the competition sufficiently to be able to move together with some imagined coherence. Uh, we don't have models a whole lot of models of what works in terms of collaboration. And all of us have internalized powerlessness. It doesn't actually matter how much power we have. We all have internalized powerlessness from being children in this kind of society. And, um, and that means we kind of like either give up on ourselves or give up on others or give up on the possibility of togetherness. That's uh, kind of sadly built in. Okay, breath, I'm running because I'm trying to move fast. Um, so the next one is, why do we then choose consensus? Consensus is then becoming the, the or of the either. And there are three things that I think are kind of like essential to the choice to go consensus. One is that we want to include every voice and command and control models do not. The other is that we want to avoid the pitfalls of power differences, because when you have power differences, certain things are systematically invisible, systematically don't get to be part of what ends up happening. And the third is that we, have, we believe in collective wisdom. And the only way we know to do it is through consensus. So, um, I'll take the next one and then pause again. So um, I'm not starting from command and control moving towards collaboration. I think it's too difficult. I am looking at what we can do to move from consensus to integration. And, and there are three shifts that I see in that transformation. One is we do not actually need to include every voice. We only need to include every need. And if you recognize that the number of needs that are present for any given decision-making situation, um, beyond a certain number of people, adding more people will not add more needs. 
it will add more people who have the same need, but not more needs. So if you're not playing the numbers game, which is the majority rule thing that I didn't even put on the, on the slide, if you're not gonna play the majority thing, it doesn't matter how many people have which need. So long as the need is included, those people who have that need are included with it. So you're searching for all the needs, not all the voices. That is one of the ways that you create efficiency without compromising collaboration. The second shift is rather than trying to avoid power differences and imagine that there's such, first of all, that power is bad. And second, that you can actually not have power differences. Instead of that, you engage with it and build in mechanisms, which I will get to later, of how to engage with power differences so that you don't compromise on having all the information that you need for a good decision. The third is consensus processes have a tendency to create pressure to agree. If instead of creating pressure to agree, you invite dissent and engage with it, you are very efficiently going towards what are the points that you need to engage with in order to create a collaborative outcome that, that gives you the collective wisdom. So those are the three key transformations. And uh, I'm now going to pause the screen and come back to have a, hopefully a little conversation um yeah um what you're saying has resonated with me so deeply uh so far um and i just have a question about the internalized powerlessness because although i haven't read it before just you described about it's something that we all experience from the way we're raised and as a parent and as a daughter of very strict parents, um, I, I kind of resonate with it, even though I don't exactly know what you mean. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little more about it and I, you know, I, how I, does it manifest? Yeah, I can give an example of how it starts. As a child, you're trained to ask the following question. Can I dot, dot, dot. You recognize that question? What does this question do? It gives the other person power to answer a question about you. It's a complete abdication of power and it's expected of children and we internalize it. It's an entirely different question to say, are you okay if I do this? Because then I'm asked a question, if I'm the adult, I'm asked a question in which I answer about me. I have the freedom to know if I'm okay or not okay with a child doing this or that, but I do not have the power to say what a child can or cannot do. Once I start playing there, I completely mess up any sense of agency because I actually interfere with what is true physically. If I tell the child, no, you cannot turn on the TV, when in reality what I'm saying is I really don't want you to turn on the TV and if you turn on the TV, I will punish you, which is a statement about me, which I have every power to say. But if I tell the child, you cannot turn on the TV, I mess with their understanding of reality. Not just, I, it's not just that I control them. I mess with their understanding. Another one is where we talk about consequences instead of punishment. Consequence speaks to causality. If I say, if you do this, there will be consequences. The co I'm, I'm, um, pretending as if there's a causal link between the child's action and the consequence, but there isn't. There's human choice involved. So these are just two examples. There are many. Can, Building can a how, how it how it manifests though as an adult is kind of the question. 
yes well. we are constantly um monitoring what happens around us in terms of what will be the consequences to us acting this or that way we are not sufficiently inner oriented to our own needs and our willingness to discern which consequence to my actions am I willing to um, to to accept or not? So nonviolence fundamentally is a willingness to face whatever will be the consequences of our actions, so long as they are in line with our values. Um, I think Kazu will completely agree with me that that's a core aspect of nonviolence. If we are trained to be fearful of our consequences, we're less likely to feel powerful. And I'll give you an, a, a really potent story example. Um, um, a couple, Samuel and Pearl Oliner, did a massive piece of research. I think it's called or something altruism. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't remember the title of the book. They, what they studied is people who rescued Jews during the Holocaust. And they did massive interviews of 400 people who rescued Jews during the Holocaust and 800 people who didn't. Anyone who knows social science, this is off the chart, large sample. And they crisscrossed them through any variable known to social science and none of the variables had any predictive value in terms of distinguishing between those who did or didn't. There were two primary things. The one that is relevant is the people who saved Jews turned, tended to come from non-punitive households. And it, I wouldn't have thought of it, but once it came to my awareness, it's clear. If you come from a non-punitive household, you're less oriented towards fear and more oriented towards values and intrinsic motivation. Make sense? Does that answer your question now? Okay, there's another question. Hi, B. Hi, Mickey. Um, I uh, really appreciated hearing the model laid out, which I haven't seen before. Um, I didn't know what your model was. Um, to me, the question is uh, what the model you shared about uh, leaves out to me is that there is actually, um, I don't know a better way to say it, but right and wrong or, or values. Um, I hear a piece in what you've shared in the model that can lead to false equivalences. Can I share an example from Extinction Rebellion, which I'm a, a part of? And I would say the, the, the way that I want to respond is you can only apply this way of making decisions that I haven't actually given you specific tools, but this framework for making decisions, you can only apply it with people that you're willing to collaborate with. And if you're not willing to collaborate with certain people, then you won't apply it with them. But what I'm trying to get at is if there's a core difference in values, uh -huh. then the model you laid out, I don't see how it can always work. In fact, I think that model could be used to enable oppression or make false equivalences or, um, yeah, there, 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 there are some actual values that I think um, one has to, uh, support in order to maybe that's the same thing you just said a moment ago like if you're not okay. willing to collaborate with people who don't have shared values then the model can't be applied then i would say then you can't apply it yes yeah and, no, but and I'm, a, I'm asking you if that's if you believe that the that that's required for the model to work no no the only thing that's required is whoever runs the processes needs to have faith that the gaps can be bridged. The participants in the process don't need to have that faith. The only requirement of participants in such processes is that they have a willingness to look for a solution that works for everyone. But we are ahead of the game. I'll get there uh, down the line. Are you willing to 
wait until there's a bit more information before we get into this, please? Sure. Thank you. Uh -huh. So if we're looking at integrative decision making, there are a few distinctions that are really important. And I just want to say I'm doing a survey, an overview. I'm not actually teaching you here how to do this because it's impossible to teach people how to do this in the amount of time that is here. I'm sharing with you the principles and the high level ideas about the process. Some people can take these principles and already run with them and do something that will be useful. I welcome you experimenting with it. But if you actually want to learn it and run processes and engage in processes, it requires a lot more um, commitment, investment of energy to do that. And we can talk about that later. So the first, prince, the first distinction is the, is the distinction between principles and positions. And this, I think, touches a little bit on what B just brought up. And I will illustrate it with an example. My biggest project that I did um, was a, a piece of collaborative lawmaking that I did in the state of Minnesota on the topic of child custody legislation. Nothing that I ever thought would be of particular interest to me, but I didn't particularly care about the topic. It was just something that I was called to support. Uh, I later learned that it's kind of like second tier culture wars. It's coded, like many other things it's coded. If you're this, you're that, etc. And this was before Zoom, this was before even Maestro conferencing. Uh, so um, they, all of it was happening on, they used to be freeconference.com if anybody remembers that, which always was crackling. So all these, all of that and people are talking and they are suspicious, they don't wanna get on the, they don't want to do the process, but they agreed to come to the call. And these are people who have been at it for 10 years. And at one point, the topic was whether or not there was going to be a presumption of shared equal parenting in cases of divorce. That was the question on the table. And then one person says, look, which of course, when somebody says, look, you know, there's going to be trouble right afterwards. So he says, look, some of us just don't believe that the presumption of shared equal parenting is wise. It's a philosophical difference. That's all there is to it. So I didn't have, I, I didn't actually have enough information to know what to do with this. So I asked him, what is it that makes it not wise? And he said, blah, 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 whatever he said, I don't remember, but it was enough information for me to know what was important to him. So I said to him, okay, here's what I'm getting. What's important to you is that every family will end up with a custody arrangement that works for that family. Did I get it right? Damn right, that's exactly what I meant. Okay, then I took a leap because I couldn't even see people's faces, nothing. I took a leap and I said, I bet anything that, let's call her Nancy, the woman from the other side who is all completely advocating for shared equal parenting, I bet anything that she agrees with you on that, that she also wants that. And then I checked and I said, Nancy, is it true that you also want every family to have this custody arrangement that works for that family. She says, yes, but I said, forget about the but. The but we will work out when we're together. But right now I wanna take a step back and show this group that even though these two people are completely at odds with each other about their positions, they had an agreement at the level of principles. That shift made it possible for them to agree to come to a meeting we met for one day that was incredibly chaotic. People came and went, legislators, lawyers, whatever. They weren't even all there for the whole day. But at the end of that one day, after 10 years of animosity, they agreed on a list of 25 principles that 
we then later added one more, but that guided the entire work of two years on the project, those principles that we derived in one day. So that's, um, that's one key distinction that helps us in collaborative decision making. Second is that there's a difference between shift and compromise. And this gets to the either or thing. A compromise, um, okay, I'm, I'm going to introduce a name of a woman that I revere that is all but unknown, but I think her name is finally starting to get revived, Mary Parker Follett. She lived and worked 100 years ago. We have her to thank for the distinction between power over and power with. We have her to thank for the foundational research and and conceptualization of what later became win-win um, methodology, and yet we don't know her name. This is the way of women being erased from history. She says that there are three, three ways to work out differences, domination, compromise, and integration. In domination, one party gets what it wants and the other loses. In compromise, both parties lose. No one gets what they want. And in integration, every, there's a chance that everyone will get what they wish for, what they want. I don't remember the words exactly. And then when I read her books and started digging into it, what I learned in, is she says that compromise is quantitative while uh, integration is qualitative. And that really got me interested and I thought long and hard about it. And here's what I came to of what she, I think, means. Compromise assumes a kind of scarcity and unidimensionality. In order to agree, each party has to give up something of the gap between them so that everybody can walk away a little bruised, but we still have an agreement. Integration transcends the terms of the either or, goes to a different place. I would say, go even further and say, sometimes it can be the same solution, but it energetically will feel creative rather than a defeat. And that experience of inner shift to where something opens, there's creativity, there's willingness, that shift is completely different from compromise. The third distinction is that all of us always have what we, what we want, our preferred outcome. And think for a moment about pizza. I don't know why I use the pizza example because I don't, I'm not a big pizza eater, but it's still easy. Let's say that my preferred pizza has pineapple, cheese, olives, and garlic. That's, let's say, that's my preferred pizza. There are going to be very few people in the world that are going to want to share that pizza with me. If we're going for preference, I'm going to be fighting with everyone if I want to share pizza. But if I look at willingness, I probably have a much wider range of pizzas that I am willing to eat than the, the one pizza that is my preference. That's key to making solutions that work for everyone. I have been in numerous situations where the final outcome is nobody's preference, but it's everybody's willingness because everybody sees that if you're looking to attend to the principles, to the underlying needs, the criteria that we derive together, whatever you're going to call that, if you're going to attend to all of that, it's going to require everyone moving away from their preference into their willingness. That is key, essential. And the whole thing is based on a commitment to solutions that work for everyone. It's a different mindset than the either or mindset. And I will illustrate that with a tiny, tiny story example. 
which is I, um, I worked once with an organization where there was going to be, um, it was a um, social service agency and their CEO was retiring. They were doing um, an executive search, but it was delayed. They didn't find a candidate or whatever. And it looked like the five people who were like the second tier management were going to have to co-manage for a while until they found someone. And the, the ses that particular session was about supporting them in how to prepare for that possibility. And they instantly all agreed that the key thing would be how they would make decisions. I said, great, let's look at how you can make decisions. Let's pick a decision that you need to make that is a pretty simple, straightforward problem so that we don't have to go through a lot of stuff to just hear what the problem is. Simple, straightforward problem. Let's see how we solve it. So they said what the problem was. I don't even remember what it was. And then I went around the circle. I said, okay, each of you tell me how you want to solve this problem. Could not be more divergent. It was like everybody was on their own planet. And then I said, okay, now I would like each of you to think after what you heard, what would be a solution that would work for everyone? Don't say what it is, just think it. Finish the thinking and tell me when you finish the thinking. And I did that because we're so swayed by what each other say that I wanted them each to be grounded in their own thinking before we shared anything. When they were all done thinking, we had it shared. It already went from like all over the place into a much smaller gap and we worked it out within five minutes. And the key was the commitment to a solution that works for everyone. So I think, that is a good place to stop, but let me just check what comes. Yes. So I will stop the sharing here and open up to questions yet again. There is a question in the chat. Uh, I'll, I'll read it out loud in case there's somebody who's here on the phone. So is compromise an agreement made when people give in and give up some of what they really want and then they decide how to share this loss equally between them? I like the question and I would say is not necessarily share the loss equally. This is one of those places where power differences come in because one of the places where power asserts itself is and often enough without even the person in power being aware of it is that the outcome will be skewed in the direction of the people in more power, even without trying. Goes back to internalized powerlessness, which takes many different forms. But one of the forms of internalized powerlessness is that we are all trained to prioritize the needs of the powerful. Both the powerful, the people in power and the people without power, both, uh, uh, people who are socialized for positions of privilege and people who are socialized for, for positions that lack privilege. All of us are trying to prioritize the needs of the ones with power and privilege. If you, it's most obvious around gender, but it's across every dimension that we can think of. Both men and women prioritize the needs of men. The comfort, at least the comfort of men, um, I just want to just do a um, kind of like a reality check. The women who are here, nod your head if you know that you have habitually prioritized the needs and comfort of men without really wanting to. Okay. And making it invisible to the men so they don't even know we're doing it. Yeah. Men, a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. Of, ed of education. So it's not everyone who said yes, but it's so prevalent that it's wrenchingly painful to know this. And this cuts across all things. Both white people and people of color prioritize the comfort of white people. Both upper class people and lower class people prioritize the comfort and the needs of the people in the upper classes, etc. So 
if we don't actively pay attention to it, if we don't actively pay attention to it, then we are going to reproduce power relations even when we're trying to collaborate. Um, yeah, I'm going to pause because some of the things, especially when I try to be condensed and kind of like cover a lot of ground in a little bit of time, I feel the intensity, the emotional and political intensity of things said, and I just want to give it room just to breathe for a few seconds. <sighs> okay, any other questions? Um, yeah, I want to say one more thing about this, which is um, agreements that are based on compromise and or on power differences and or on feeling like I can't say no to something, those agreements are likely to be broken, sabotaged, ignored, trampled on, and recycled into the next cycle of, okay, that agreement broke, let's do this again. No agreement can hold and serve if it's not fully entered by all people. This is this thing, if you may remember that I said that command and control is efficient in the very short run. Command and control results in agreements being made that people are not actually wholeheartedly uh, engaged in. And the result is that they will do everything possible to do the minimal possible thing they can get away with without being caught and punished. That's how we live in terms of laws. The laws are imposed on us. The laws don't necessarily make sense to us. We have no particular way to move towards law changing. So what are we all doing? It's like we're trying to kind of like walk between the drops. Um, in the city of Porto Alegre in Brazil, uh, there was an experiment that went on for quite a number of years that I just recently learned has been dismantled and I am still recovering from the shock of that. And that was an experiment in um, participatory budgeting. It was the first place in the world to do it. And after about 10 years of doing it, they took measurements. And, and here's what happened. That was in 2011. I don't have data for afterwards. And it's like I said, it's just recently been dismantled. At that time, 50,000 people out of a city of a, a million and a half participated. And participating wasn't putting a, a ballot in a box. Participating meant you came to meetings and deliberated with people on the budget. 50,000 people did it. That's a huge, huge level of, of um, citizen engagement, number one. Number two, every measure that you would apply, health, education, sanitation, transportation, everything improved. Number three, the index of inequality went down. So it was a success by any measure that you would take, except the power of the powerful to keep their power. And I don't know the circumstances that led to it being dismantled, but I would be entirely shocked if disapproval from the powerful wasn't a big part of what led to it. I just don't know the specifics. But, but it's very clear, it's proven again and again and again and again and again, that when you involve larger and larger groups of people in decision making, the results are ultimately better for everyone, so long as you work out the, what to do with the powerful, which we'll get to in a moment. So unless there are more questions, I am going to go back to... I do want to just bring to your attention that there, there's been some activity in the chat box since the question about compromise. If you want to just take a quick peek to see if you want to respond. Okay. Ah, 
how to work with internalized powerlessness is the is the piece that I am um, that I'm bringing up. Um, let me think for a second. Um, I think I want to uh, put it on hold and see if it will come up in a different context because one of my worries is that people will take it as one more thing that we need to individually work with. And I think fundamentally we need systemic solutions to systemic problems and not individual solutions. It's not that there aren't things that we can do individually, but coming together with other people and creating movements, organizations, communities, families, schools, all of that, that are based on different principles, that is the solution. Because when we, when we actually work out what it takes to create agreements that work for everyone, we increase capacity for everyone. Not the topic of today, uh, but more uh, more on that maybe at the end if there is time left. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about what supports collaboration, what supports collaborative decision making. These are things that precede any particular process. The more of these things exist in the circumstances that you have, the less important it is what process you're going to use. So I'll go through each of them because they are really important and people don't usually think about it. Very often we come together based on some vague sense of shared values, but without a clear shared purpose. If we don't have a shared purpose, we don't have a compass. We don't know where we're going and it's gonna be harder to make decisions. Clarity of purpose is key. Second issue that often happens that interferes with collaboration is issues are framed ideologically. When issues are framed ideologically, we're going to entrench ourselves in our positions. The more we can frame issues in practical terms rather than ideological terms, the more likely we are to come up with a collaborative solution. Third, that the people who are going to be making the decision are directly impact by, impacted by the result. Otherwise, opinions are super cheap. If I am not impacted by what happens, I'll just give my extreme opinions and who cares? But if I know that I'm gonna live with, live with these people and whatever we decide is going to impact everyone, including me, I'm much more likely to mobilize to collaborate. It's just common sense. Um, a different way is I have a stake in the solution. Maybe it's not gonna impact me, but it matters to me. Key is that we have the authority to implement solutions. Uh, a lot of people work with, um, you know, kind of like marginalized communities where there are these bogus processes to get input from the marginalized communities about what is going to be done to them. But that input is empty because they are not actually involved in the implementing. They don't have the authority. So there isn't going to be engagement and there isn't going to be collaboration. If you want the engagement, give people the authority to implement. Second best is moral authority. The thing that happened in Minnesota, we didn't have any authority to implement anything. We only were doing something that was going to bring um, proposed legislation to the Congress in Minnesota. I think it's Congress is what it's called, but I don't know. Anyway, um, whatever that parliament is. We were going to bring legislation to them, but there was moral authority because the people who participated in crafting the legislation were from across all the stakeholders, all the opponents. The fact that all of them could agree meant that when it came time to vote in the two houses, which together had 180 people, 
only three people voted against, and all three of them were in the Senate that wasn't actually represented in the process. Only the House was represented. So moral authority counts, and a lot of us forget it. Um, the last two is to have all the necessary people in the room. Many times we exclude people from the process, either explicitly or implicitly. And if we don't have them there, the decision is going to have less capacity to be meaningful. And so therefore the collaboration will not be as meaningful. And of course, the more trust exists in the group, the easier the collaboration will be. But it's just useful to use this as a map, kind of like a checklist. Oh, we have this, we have this, we, have, we don't have this, we don't have this, we don't have this. Each one of these that you don't have will require more of the process and the structure to hold the decision making. Okay. Come on. Okay. Now I'm going to introduce very super briefly the process that I created for collaborative group decision making. It's based on these principles. The same kinds of principles could yield multiple different types of processes for different purposes. This is a process designed specifically for group decision making with a facilitator. There are people who apply it without a facilitator, but it's designed for that particular purpose. And it has three phases, though hardly any process that I have led followed the textbook that I created the textbook, so I know. Um, hardly any of them followed the textbook. Sometimes you go from phase one directly to phase three because it's so clear what you are looking at. Sometimes you start with phase three, you go back to phase one, uh, you jump to phase two, you go again to phase two. Sometimes it's not phases, you just track it. It's not a linear process. I'm giving you a linear picture just for conceptual ease. Uh, it's the same thing, I'm imagining that some of you know the work of Dominic Barter. It's the same principle, keep tight to the principle and adapt the form to the circumstances. All that said, in the first phase, which I call criteria gathering, you collect all of what's important to everyone in the group. You collect it and put it in one list. It's key for it to be in one list. It's not like, it, this is what's important to people in group A, and this is what's important to people in group B, and this is what's important to people in group C. You keep it polarized if you do it. You put it all in one list, and everyone has to agree to everything that is on that list. And if they don't agree to it, you work with it until you have a list of criteria that everybody says, yes, if we're going to work out this problem, in a way that works for everyone, we have to attend to these criteria. This is a trust building thing and it's also information gathering. Second phase is the proposal creation. That is where you basically brainstorm. Here's a list of criteria. What are the ways to address it? And you have one proposal, many proposals. There are many reasons for why do one, why do many, all of that, not getting into the details of how to do it that's available, there's online training that you can get access to. I'll talk about that in a moment later at the end. Uh, but but that, is, that is one of the uh, one of the phases. One of the features is that you have criteria and you look for solutions that address the criteria rather than just brainstorm solutions. And the last one is you now have one or more proposals. Is it possible to convert any of these proposals into an actual decision that everybody can accept as their own? When I was doing the work in Minnesota, the, the, I explained it to people. You're, we are looking for something that you can then go to your constituency because everyone who was in the room with me, they represented constituencies. You need, you're gonna need to be an ambassador of this process to your constituency. If you are not able to be an ambassador, we're not done with the process. So that was, it was a pretty high bar. 
So, um, but this is also the phase where I do the counterintuitive and I invite dissent. I invite dissent. This is one of the ways to, to move away from the consensus uh, vortex of please agree, please agree, please agree. Oh, come on, what's wrong with you? Everybody else is agreeing. Why are you raising concerns still? There is this, this deep understanding that up to a point, every concern that is raised and engaged with improves the quality of the decision. I'm saying up to a point because you can't do infinite dissent courting because every group has a point of decision fatigue. Eventually, it's like you just want to have a decision. Okay, we've integrated and integrated and integrated. There can be a point of over integration and the group gets tired of an, or an individual gets tired, etc. And hovering around the entire process is the question of what to do with outliers. And, and this is to me one of the beauties of uh, these kinds of processes is that outliers are seen as gifts because outliers will articulate things that other people don't dare say. Outliers will have perspectives that can inform of new needs that were not integrated, that were not included in maybe an earlier version of it. And how we engage with outliers really has a lot to say about the level of trust, creativity, and goodwill that will exist in the group. Because when I handle one outlier, four others go, okay, this is a safe place. I can actually speak what is important to me because I'm not going to be shot down. All right, let's see what is the next one. Okay, uh, before attending to power differences, I'm going to pause again and ask for questions. Hi, um, my question is around inviting dissent and and not um, inviting too much dissent because the group needs to come to a decision and how to do that without taking the power position and saying like and moving in that way um, okay so so here is um so i didn't get into the technicalities of the tools but the, there's a thing that i call the threshold of dissent it depends on what question you ask. For example, let's say we're trying to make a decision about something. Just, and I'm asking you, notice the difference in the two questions that I ask you. One question is, um, if, if we, uh, and I would ask, uh, uh, as if I'm asking a group, raise your hand if you are concerned that taking this decision is going to derail us from attending to our purpose, okay? That's a very high threshold. You would be looking for very significant concerns to answer that. Mm -hmm. Now I could ask a different question. The different question is, raise your hand if you see even the smallest improvement that we can make to this decision. You see, I open it up mm -hmm. or I close it, not to who, but to what. Now, there's still a question of power because if you, you have internalized that your concerns don't matter, you will raise the threshold for yourself even when I keep it low. You see that, right? Mm -hmm. So this is where it gets into the art of how to engage with power differences, which is exactly the next, the next slide. So first of all, what is it that power differences do? they reduce the chances that we will hear the needs, the perspectives, the ideas, the concerns, the experiences of those with less power. That is what power differences do. I just, it's simple, it's descriptive. It doesn't uh, make anyone bad. This is what happens because of that training to prioritize the needs and the comfort of the powerful, unless we do something, we will lose these things. It's simple and it's devastating. You see the relationship with your question, Adrian, yeah? 
yeah. So, I, again, I'm not going to get into details, but this is the domain of the problem. This is the domain of the problem. This is what you need to deal with in order to attend to power differences. And this, how you attend to it will change across cultures, across all kinds of things. But if you keep this in mind and you keep asking yourself, are we doing enough to incorporate the needs, perspectives, ideas, and concerns of those with less power? What else can we do? And it, a lot of it has to do with how I manage thresholds. So for example, I remember once being, being invited to uh, um, an organization where they had a, a particular meeting that was happening once a month between the managers of the service units and the top management. That was the, name, the meeting and it was dead. I, I asked to come to observe a meeting before working with them. It was absolutely dead. The CEO got up and talked and talked and talked. Then two of the people from top management talked and talked and talked. Then they asked if there was any question. Nobody said any question. There was this kind of like awkward silence, like, okay, then we'll close the meeting. Terrible, it, nothing happened. The next time I went there, I said, okay, now I would like to hear from every single person in this meeting, what you think will make this meeting work better. And I'd like to start from the middle managers who are managing the service unit and then hear from the top management and then hear from the CEO. So I reversed the order of hearing from people. That made all the difference because they didn't have the CEO to orient to, they could orient to the more closely to the truth within them. I could see saying, you know, okay, so we have a decision to make and this group of people are in the field, they're going to implement it. And this group of people are sitting in the office and they're just thinking about this. I want to hear even the smallest concern that the people in the field will have. And from the people in the office, I only wanna hear serious red flags. So I can have split thresholds. It doesn't have to be the same threshold for everyone. So I'm just giving you a flavor of how you work with it. But I think it's key to remember that this is what the impact is if we don't attend to it. I think I have very little more, just, uh, yeah, now, uh, no, I think I'll, I'll stop. And I think that power differences is such a key thing. Uh, yeah, let's do this. And then I have essentially one more slide and then we'll go into uh, breakout groups. So questions, comments about, you know, basically touching on the edge of attending to power differences. Any questions or comments about that? Yeah, my question has to do with the connection between attending to power difference and the role of outliers. Mm -hmm. is, is it something that outliers, I mean, first I had a question is, if, is an outlier needed in a group to make the group richer? And also how can the outlier help with, or do the outlier help with attending to the power difference? Uh, not necessarily. Um, you know, an outlier can be a person with or without power. Um, Either way, um, if you're interested in the question of outliers, I have an entire blog post that I have about the question of basically how to deal with outliers and outliers and how to be more effective when we are an outlier. My question is about um, kind of a clarification. Is this process something that a group can do on its own or do you see usually that you need an outside facilitator and the, the connection is that I can imagine if it tries, if the group tries to do it on, a, on its own, there could be a lot of controversy about the nature of power differences, maybe. And like, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I would say that if you're going to do it with a group on its own, 
you need to have more trust within the group, most likely. And it would still be helpful to have someone as a designated facilitator, even if they're a member of the group. And of course, questions of how you manage being both facilitator and participant are again, a lot of technical questions. It's beyond what I would be able to cover here. Uh, hi. hi, I have a question, um, I think related to uh, not outliers, but the threshold. Uh, threshold setting and how to attend to power differences there. Um, you mentioned before that if there's a low threshold and somebody has some internalized oppression that makes it harder for themselves to uh, offer dissent, that that's one aspect of yeah. the power difference and to attend to that. Uh, so I, I want to ask a question about how also to surface within a group if there's a, a difference in privilege that the group may actually develop decision fatigue uh, or a portion of the group may develop decision fatigue because they're ready to move on because they don't see the impacts of what the outlier is bringing or there's a minority of people who see that their dissent is, is important to them, but it, there's a gap between whether or not the larger group understands what that impact is and therefore are willing to treat it as like a, a valid reason to keep talking about something and they're just ready to move. So how, how would you, in a group, sort of um, create awareness about this difference and then decide how to move in the process together? Um, so I'm smiling because in a different context, I am in an exploration with you on this very question. And if I knew how to answer it, I would apply it in that context. I'm learning about it with you. I don't know. Heard, Heard. thank you. Uh, but I, I would say, I'd say that again? I thought I'd try because it's a different context. Yeah. I would say that um, having a deep degree of accuracy about what is or isn't within capacity, mourning what isn't within capacity, seeing what is possible within capacity and using that as a way to increase capacity is something that holds a lot of promise with me and that I, I don't yet know exactly how to implement it in that context where you and I are playing with it, but that's the piece that I'm looking at. It's how to use existing capacity as a, as a place of rest from within which capacity can be grown. Thank you. Now maybe we can apply it in the other context, having talked about it here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the next slide is the super high level of a project that I was involved in three years ago of coming up with a model for global governance um, that we submitted to a competition, there was an international competition that I knew completely we were going to lose because our proposal was radical, heavy and tech light. And I predicted and was right that what was going to win was going to be tech heavy and radical light. Um, but still the result of it is that there's now a model for global governance that works from the local to the global. And there were very severe constraints on what could be um, models that would be included. And in the early weeks, as we were talking about it, we adopted a principle that I think speaks to what you just were talking about, Dan. And that is a principle that in order to move anywhere, we have to make things work for the most powerful and the least powerful. It's very easy to make things work for the most powerful. Just look around. That's what is happening. It's working for them. It's dubious how well it's working for them, but it's working in a certain way for the most powerful. It's not working for the overwhelming majority of the world and, and for non-human -life, non life all over the world. <coughs> But it's less easy to see why we would want to 
to make things work for the most powerful if we could, in theory, make them work for the least powerful? Why not screw the powerful? And <clears throat> there are two reasons for, for that, that are, for me, one of them is practical and one of them is deep. The practical reason is because you can come up with, it's actually very easy to come up with models that work, very easy. But it's, it's impossible to get them going because the powerful will block them. So if you want something to happen, you need to engage the powerful from the get-go so that they will know that their needs count too. Part of the reason why people in power exercise so much control is because of tremendous fear. This is that internalized powerlessness. Tremendous fear that my power is the only reason why anybody listens to me. My power is the only reason why anybody smiles at me. My power is the only reason why I get anything to happen. If I didn't have the power, people would hate me. They would treat me the, the same shitty way that I treat everyone else. That's the practical reason. And then there is the deeper reason for me, which is <clears throat> if I end up with a world that works for me at the expense of the people who are now in power, I didn't actually create anything better than a world that works for them and not for me. I'm still in the same either or logic that from the beginning I wanted to replace. And we actually believe that we managed to create that, but of course it hasn't been tested. It's still just in theory. So that some of the core principles are to localize as many decisions as possible based on who is impacted. So if there's a decision that just impacts my block, nobody from outside my block needs to know anything about how we attend to it. But if, if this is a decision that is going to impact several blocks, we need to somehow come together to make a decision and that becomes more complicated. If we're going to build a road between town A and town B, that impacts town A and town B. So both need to be involved. So there's <clears throat> a mapping of concentric circles that is coordinating such decisions and maintains local accountability. That's, again, I'm not gonna get into details. Then when you have problems that are more complex, you use sortition which is a process of, um, what's it called? Uh, random selection of people from the entire population that's gonna be impacted. And there are complex algorithms that allow for stratified sortitions and things like this that can account for power differences, et cetera. And then if you are in a low trust context, which right now everything in the world is low trust, you need multi-stakeholder circles so that that is the only way to attend to the first principle is to bring everyone to the table across the power differences and do a good process where you come up with a solution. So one of my pet wishes is for someone to gather into a room, CEOs of energy corporations, climate scientists, climate activists, frontline communities, um, whoever else, I, whatever we define as stakeholders and get them together to sit and come up with policy recommendations that are gonna work for all of them. The moral authority of such a circle would have no limits and would change the scene. But who is going to summon that circle? I don't know. And the last principle relates to the question that someone asked relying on facilitation to support integration at every circle. Because if you don't have facilitation, you're less likely to have an integrative result. And there's a town in England called Froome. It's a town of 23,000 people, something like this. And it, it is ruled by the people in town without any political affiliation. It's all independents that are running it and they're running it everything that they're doing is facilitated meetings because they figured out early on. And if anybody is interested in that experiment, look up flat back democracy. That will give you that information. And I think that is it. I just wanted to 
Um, I, I'll come back to this in a moment, but I just wanted to, to conclude with saying that we have the solutions, we have the skills. What is lacking is political will. I don't know how to generate political will, but that is what is lacking to get to a path of a, of a nonviolent future. So I think what I want to do is uh, pause now. I think this would be a good time to do the small groups and then come back for last minute questions and talking about if people want to learn more what they can do. So East Point Peace Academy um, operates on a set of principles that are often referred to as the gift economy. And this offering, uh, this sharing from Mickey as part of our where do we go from here speaker series, like all of our events and offerings, um, does not have a fee attached to it. Um, we, do not, oops, we do not charge for any of our offerings. And uh, here's a list of the principles of the gift economy. We won't go into these now for time's sake, but I encourage you to go to eastpointpeace.org and look at the gift economy language that we have there to learn a bit about yeah, the deep reasons that we are operating this way to try to move out of the clutches of consumer capitalism. One of those um, principles is transparency and part of our practice is to always, uh, you know, share with participants in our, our various offerings how money is flowing um, with East Point. And this just gives you a, a quick look at what happened last year. Um, and you'll notice there that the vast majority of, of the money that has um, allowed us to continue with our programming has come from the folks who come through our workshops, people who participate in, in our community events and so forth, not from foundations. A very small amount of our um, budget is funded by foundations. We really rely on our community to support the work that we do. Um, and I'm having a hard time here with my, there we go. And this just shows you some of the uh, groups that we've worked with. Um, you can see that it's a mixture of um, inmates who participate in Kingian nonviolence programs in prisons and jails uh, in the Bay Area, as well as various community groups um, in the outside community. And again, we don't charge for any of our offerings. And I think it may be perfectly obvious to people that the folks inside who benefit from our work uh, inside our prison facilities are depending on the outside community to um, make it possible for us to bring the programming to them. A beautiful part of our experience has been, however, that um, on a couple of occasions, prisoners themselves have actually fundraised for us and given us the message that they want our programming and workshops about nonviolence to be available to people on the outside. It's a very humbling and beautiful uh, experience to receive that generosity. This is a quote from Marshall Rosenberg, when giving is done out of pure joy, you can't tell who the giver is and who the recipient is. Captured beautifully by that, that photo, I think. And so at East Point, we, we just uh, offer to folks that if it will bring joy to you, if it will feel really good to you to make a financial contribution to East Point, we welcome it. And at the same time, with the, the same uh, you know, feeling of, of openness, we offer our programs as a gift to the community um, free of charge. And I just wanna let you know that um, when we checked in with Nikki about um, how we could help to meet her sustainability needs for her um, work, uh, we decided together that when the contributions from this event are sort of tallied, that we'll, we'll do a virtual uh, money pile is what folks often call it, where we'll just look at the, the total that has come in and we'll ask ourselves some questions and then come up with a, a decision about how to distribute the money. And those questions are, how much is there? How much is in the pile? Um, that meaning how, many, um, how much money has come in through 
your contributions today. What are the respective sustainability needs for East Point and for Mickey as she carries forward her work? And how do we orient the resources towards those needs in a way that cares for all of us to the, um, the greatest extent possible? So we'll do that after um, we've received your contributions and um, we'll really appreciate that. To make a contribution, go ahead and uh, visit our website, eastpointpeace.org, click the donate button in the right hand corner. And when you donate, um, please write speaker series Mickey Kashtan in the memo. So that way we will be able to track how much came in for this particular offering so we can divvy it up uh, accordingly with Mickey afterwards. I am now going to um, come on go back to just say a bit about each of these things uh, which are different ways of getting involved and there are more websites didn't think of including all of them but Chris said and before I send this I can I can add all the links uh, but convergent facilitation, uh, you can get a packet to learn, uh, to read about it. There's online training, and I will say it exists in two forms. It's exactly the same training, but you have two different ways of entering it. One is for just people who want to learn it for themselves, for whatever they're going to do. Um, and the other is for people who want to learn it in order to serve at this time of global crisis. And for those, it's available on a gift economy. So it's all on an honor system. Um, and for the people who want to serve and take the training, we now have a series of weekly coaching calls for people who are just trying to learn and get better at this and better at this and better at this to help as collectively shift. So that is not in the primer, but I will include it, uh, information about it in the what I, what I send. The, if you're interested in the global governance model, there's a link to that. And um, Chris mentioned the nonviolent global liberation community. This is a group of people um, that is actually trying to take all of these principles and to create an organization that is based on them that includes both learning and serving. Um, and you can find that out by going there. And that's it by way of presentation. Yeah, Mickey, I was just, I was wondering now that you finished the last slides, whether you could speak to, kind of, I guess, I, I sense that there's a field of sadism, and then you have the masochists that follow the sadists in throughout society. Throughout, it's it's it goes from our governments down to our organizations and okay. institutions. So, and 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 how does here's yeah, my here's it, my my simple yeah. thought about this. My simple mm -hmm. thought is, if there's actually a practical problem to solve, you get the right people in the room. You address it practically and not ideologically. And you believe that people can actually do it. They are more likely to do it than not. If you do this consecutively with problem after problem with the right people in the room, you will begin to shift that field. That's my faith. If you don't have faith, you can't do it. I'm not saying that if you do have faith, you can, but not having faith is an almost guarantee that you won't get positive results. I don't know how more strongly to say it, how significant the spiritual orientation of the facilitator is. Hmm. Uh, thank you. I wanted to comment on the sortition thing. I mention it because it's part of, um, it's seen as part of Extinction Rebellion's demand, which I'm a member of. Um, though, yeah. So anyway, so I just wanted to flag that sortition to me as a Latina woman in this country um, and also as a member of a mostly white male middle-class organization, the idea that we could 
do a random pick to make a major decision and that the, the randomness of it is supposed to be fair, make it fair and inclusive, which is how these things are usually framed, which is how certification is usually framed. I just wanted to flag how as a, that literally turns my stomach and makes me scared when I think about it. If you wanna, if you think about the jury system, that's a perfect example of how sortition doesn't work in terms of fairness. It kind of flattens all the differences. It flattens the history of oppression. It flattens the current conditions of inequality. Um, even if the sortition is done with an eye towards diversity, it, it doesn't actually deal with the social relations that we have right now enough. For me, any sortition would have to have a container with explicit parameters that are for justice of this, the assembly that uses the sortition would have to be bound by. And even then, it's still, I think, a sortition, like, for example, within a mostly white male middle class organization, doing a sortition um, is not going to meet the aspirational goals we have as an organization. Um, and I think you need to bring in people or do a different kind of selection process, maybe in addition to sortition. So that's, that's all I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I want to say that what I would extract as a common thing between us is that sortition by itself won't do anything. The process, which process is used once the people in the room makes a huge difference. And I think we can agree on that. Yeah? Yes. Thank you. Yes. So I'd like to hear just the way I like to end things is I'd like to hear from a couple of people. Uh, if you can have like just a tiny little thing that you're taking with you that you learned today, very, very brief so that we can hear from three or four people and then I'll give it back to Chris. Um, I'm a high school teacher and just from the beginning, um, hearing you speak to um, something beyond consensus was really helpful for me because it felt like our math department has gotten to a place of consensus, which is perhaps a step forward, but we were all so feeling like what it, like it was lacking something. So I was Thank feeling you. that. Thanks. Um, so for me, it was um, very insightful to hear that people that are educated under punitive um, models, they are more inclined to act moved by fear than by values. So this was very insightful. And also that um, the importance to care also for people in power when making decisions, not only for the powerless. I would say that intention matters, no matter what tool somebody incorporates. If the intention of inclusion and the intention of including those people with that, you know, the, the people that need to be heard in the room, if that intention is missing, then you're not going to accomplish anything with the tools that anybody gives out. So it's a process of listening, I think, is the huge issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mickey. Um, yeah, and thanks so much for your time, for your amazing work, you know, that's that's built this presentation and, and obviously it's this is scratching the surface. There's so much more that we can dig into. Well, again, thank you, Mickey. I encourage folks to unmute themselves so you can at least hear some gratitude as we say goodbye. Um, and thanks everybody for being part of this. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you, Mickey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.